Let me ask you a question. When you're 40 years old in the career that you're established in or want to be established in, are you going to make more money or less money than your parents made, at least adjusting to be in today's dollars? Now, that's a deeply personal question, but over the size of a country, we can aggregate those answers and talk about something called intergenerational income mobility. That is, what is the relationship between the income of children and the income of their parents. And then we could go even further and ask, how is that relationship, the, the relationship between the income of parents and the income of children, affected by societies that have higher levels of income inequality, higher gaps between the rich and the poor? And we're gonna be able to connect all of these concepts in this video with something called the Great Gatsby Curve. Okay, so the first thing to do is to hit the like button for the YouTube algorithm. But the second thing is, what exactly do I mean by intergenerational income mobility? Let's imagine some hypothetical society and I'm gonna divide everybody up into quintiles. So I'll have a bottom 20% up to a top 20%. If the only thing that mattered was your parents' income for the children's income, then the distribution of the children would look the exact same as the distribution of the parents. And then in the other extreme hypothetical, if the parental income didn't matter at all, then it would just be some random mixture and the children's incomes would be entirely unrelated. But more realistically, it's somewhere in between these. Parental income probably matters to some degree. And so what you might get is something that looks like this. You have an initial distribution of the parents, and then the children distribution, it has some mixing. If your parents' income was in the bottom 20%, the children could rise up. If the parents' income was in the top 20%, then their children might be beneath that in the income distribution. So that's the big idea, but how can I measure intergenerational income mobility a little bit more precisely? To help us answer this question, we're gonna to turn to a new white paper that has been released by Statistics Canada. Statistics Canada is a federally run institution in Canada and provides a lot of statistics to the Canadian public about Canadians. And the authors Marie Connolly, Catherine Hayek, and David Lapierre have come up with a new paper that's going to address exactly these issues. What they've done is they've managed to look back at five different what we call birth year cohorts. So people born in 1963, 1967, 1972, 1977, and 1982. So these are people who are now well established in their careers between ages 39 and 58 today. And what they did was they looked at their income, they have access to Canadian administrative tax records, so they have a ton of data on the actual information about these people. And then they compared their incomes to the incomes of their parents. And this is what they found. Intergenerational mobility actually got worse as time has gone onwards. What this chart shows is the amount of immobility for each of the five cohorts. So what do the numbers on the vertical axis represent in this rise from 0.19 to 0.23? This is one of several different possible statistical measures that we can use, and this specific one is called the rank-rank measure of intergenerational mobility. Basically what you do is you rank the parents from 0th to 99th percentile, and you provide them a, a rank where they are in the income distribution. And then you do the same for the children. And then you ask the statistical question, what is the correlation between the parents' income and the children's income. To what degree does the parents' income explain the distribution in the children's income? And so what this chart is showing that the intergenerational immobility, so bigger numbers mean that it's harder to rise out of say the bottom 20%, and that this measure has increased over the different cohorts. A perhaps easier way to interpret what this number is referring to, this intergenerational immobility, is to talk about probabilities. And we can do that with a so-called transition matrix. And anybody who's watched my conditional probability series will know what these are. But the idea is, at any one of these squares, we're gonna compute out the probability that you end up in the bottom 20%, depending on where your parents started, whether they were in the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth quintile. So for example, in the birth year of 1982, if your parents were in the bottom 20%, then you have a 33% chance of also being in the bottom 20%. If it was totally random, you'd only have a 20% chance. 
Contrast this to 1982 babies who were born and whose parents were in the top 20%. They only have a 13% probability of ending up in the bottom 20%. That is, you're two and a half times more likely to end up in the bottom 20% if your parents were born poor than if they were born rich. And indeed, this measure has gotten worse as time has gone on. It's still not great, but back in 1963, it was only a 27% chance, not a 33% chance, to end up in the bottom 20% if your parents were born in the bottom 20%. All right, so that is intergenerational income immobility. But what about income inequality? How is that different? And how does that relate to what we've already talked about? What we're trying to capture at any moment in time is how distributed the wealth is in a society. Is it a society where everyone's pretty close to equal and making more or less the same? Or is it a society that's very unequal and only a few make the vast majority of the wealth? For example, in Canada back in 1980, the share of the total income by the top 1% was 8.9%. But in 2010, that it increased to the share of the income by the top 1% now being 13.6%. And we're going to talk about what is the standard measure to describe this, which is something called the Gini coefficient. And here's the idea. The Gini coefficient is a number between 0 and 100%. It would be 0 in a society with perfect equality, where everyone gets exactly the same income. And then it would be 100% in the also hypothetical society where one person gets all the wealth and everybody else gets 0. So that's sort of the extremes of the Gini coefficient. To define the Gini coefficient a bit more precisely, we're going to talk about something called a Lorenz curve. So what's going on in this picture? Now, on the horizontal axis, we're talking about the share of people, the cumulative share of people. And so, for example, a point there might represent that 50% of people are going to make more than that particular point. And then on the vertical axis, it's the share of the income. And so one of the things we have is this straight line, which represents what we call the line of equality. That's that imaginary society where everyone is completely equal. So there, if you're at 50% in terms of the number of people, then they are going to make 50% of the income because it's perfect equality. But in a more realistic scenario, you have a Lorenz curve and the Lorenz curve falls beneath that line of perfect equality. So for example, at some point, you may have 50% of the people represented, but then less than 50% of the wealth represented. And so if the Lorenz curve was further from the line of equality, that would mean that the region A had a bigger area, and the further you get, the more unequal things are. And so how can we measure this? Well, let's define something called this Gini coefficient, and it is the ratio, it's the area of A, divided out by the total area, the total area underneath that line of equality, which is the area of A plus the area of B, and represents sort of like the total wealth in society. And indeed, with this definition, if the Lorenz curve was further from the line of equality, then the Gini coefficient would be a larger number. It would be more unequal. Okay, so then we can plot the change in the Gini coefficient over time, and we see that as you increase in the birth year cohort, the Gini coefficient in Canada has gone up. Okay, so now the big moment. We've talked about intergenerational income mobility, the ability to change where your income status is relative to your parents. And then we've also talked about income inequality. At a given moment in time, if you look at the society, what is the distribution of wealth among its population? But how are these two related? And we're gonna relate them with something called the Great Gatsby Curve. So this is sort of what it looks like for Canada. On the horizontal axis, we have the Gini coefficient, or in other words, our income inequality. And we've seen that in Canada, that's gotten larger as time's gotten on. And then on the vertical axis, we have the intergenerational immobility. And likewise, we've seen that that has gotten higher as time has gone on as well. And so what this chart really shows is that Canada has so-called gone up the Great Gatsby Curve. We've gotten both more unequal and it's harder to change your income status relative to your parents as time has gone on from 1963 up to 1982 birth years. I find it really interesting to try and think about all the different factors that might go into this and why we might see a plot like this. And I'd love to hear your thoughts down below in the comments. Okay, so that was the Canadian situation because our primary reference for this video is this particular Canadian study by Stats Canada. 
But we can also talk about the global situation. And here I'll put up a plot of the Great Gatsby Curve for a bunch of different countries at one moment in time. And what we're seeing here is that as countries get higher levels of income inequality, the tendency is for the higher levels of that intergenerational immobility as well. It's harder to change your rank in the income distribution relative to your parents. Canada is actually doing pretty good on this. They have lower amounts of immobility and lower amounts of inequality. The US is both more unequal and less mobile. And then it's actually South American countries in this particular data set that are all up at the top, Brazil, Peru, Chile, and Argentina. Now these countries may not be as rich as countries like the United States, but the total wealth of the society is not the question here. It's the relationship between the income inequality and the intergenerational immobility. And in these countries, they have both high levels of inequality and a low ability to move up in the income ladder as you go from one generation to the next. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have countries like Denmark, Norway, and Finland that have the lowest levels of both income inequality and intergenerational immobility. All right, so that's where I'm gonna leave it for this video. All the references that I've talked about are down in the description. And if you have any thoughts about this video, or want to share your perspectives, I'd love to see that in the comments. This, by the way, is an entirely new video format for me where I am breaking down a white paper and trying to look at data and statistics and mathematics. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like, and we're gonna be doing some more math in the next video.